In 2017, JEMP was presenting at the North America Bike Share Conference, and we presented a slide similar to this one, showing bikes at less than 3% of mode share in the US. Our point was not subtle. We were failing as an industry. We needed bikes to go from less than 3 to 5, 10, 20, 30% mode share. And if bike share systems were robust and healthy and meeting their potential, we would see this reflected in these numbers. Basically, we were asking the question, how does the US become more like Europe? A question no American likes to ask where you see that 25% you know, of trips in the Netherlands are, are by bike. In Denmark, it's 20%, Germany, 10%. And we know that in Paris, they're striving for 15% mode share by 2020. You see the stark comparison, and you wonder, you know, what are they doing right in Europe? What are we doing wrong in the US? And for me, the more relevant question than mode share is mode shift. How many different vehicles are you likely to take or different types of transportation are you likely to take on a given week or even in a given day? And does having these choices available make you more or less likely to own your own vehicle? I think in this room, we all kind of agree what the future looks like, right? Some version of Amsterdam with protected bike lanes um, or vehicle lanes. Um, with more shared vehicles and vehicle forms we haven't quite imagined yet. And when I was thinking about what I would say today about market entry, I, thought, I started to think about the past and how the challenges in 2015 when I joined the industry are different than the challenges of today. You know, back then we struggled with funding and we struggled with openness to new technologies. On the funding front, we wanted to work uh, with governments and city partners but avoid long procurements and try to find a way around public funding, which took a long time. But the private funding just wasn't there. In terms of openness to two new technologies, our city partners were, were used to a dock-based system. And you know, they were reluctant to think about versions of micro-mobility that didn't conform to the existing standard. So we worked with our city partners to open up their minds to alternative, and we would argue, better technologies. Now, today, the funding is there, and our city partners know that it, technology and innovations change faster than regulations. The challenge of today is not how we enter markets, but how we prove out longevity of alternative shared micromobility systems and how we remove barriers to scale so that we can capture mode share and mode shift. So to that end, I have four simple rules for how we can help work with cities and drive towards scale. One, focus on the whole pie, meaning the entire transportation ecosystem. Two, be real about sustainability. Three, own up to the challenges. And four, break into the cycle. Now, I've been at a bunch of conferences lately. And each time, um, the question is asked, did you get here by bike? Did you get here by scooter? Did you get here by Uber? Did you get here by Lyft? Um, so I'm going to ask a different question for the audience. Uh, my question is, how many people here plan to go home via a different mode than with which they came. Exactly. The key to the longevity of micromobility systems is optionality. If we can create a transportation ecosystem with multiple options, you know, transit for longer city trips, bikes and scooters for shorter city trips, cars as complements, then we allow users to right size their trips. We reduce congestion by getting people out of cars. You know, in the US, nearly 60% of privately operated vehicles are less than six miles. In Germany, we know that in the top five cities, 69% of trips are three miles and under. And so with jump bikes averaging two to three miles per trip, 
and scooters averaging 1 to 1.5 miles per trip, we really see the potential to reduce, reduce the number of short trips that are taken by car. We see, in short, that micro working. It's f often faster, cheaper, and more convenient than other modes of transportation. Here you see that, you know, and this is a slide of San Francisco, that a trip from City Hall to the Bayview Opera House is 20 minutes by jump bike, whereas it would be 26 minutes by car. So it's fa often faster, cheaper, and more convenient, but also a lot of fun, right? So, our, you know, again, it's working, right? And I want to you know, emphasize this point, because in Paris, we had over one million rides on our bikes and scooters in less than six months. And our riders are reporting making choices to take a bike and a scooter instead of taking a, a car ride. In Sacramento, within the first six months, we, there were more rides on a jump bike than there were in an Uber car. And what we're seeing is that micromobility is succeeding when it comes to connecting users to transit. In a survey, 38% of our riders reported to using a bike and a scooter to connect to transit. Now, on one hand, this is kind of obvious, right? It's kind of great, yes, of course, people are using it to connect. On the other hand, of all the stats that I look at in mind to understand how our systems are working, this is the most exciting to me. This shows that we're truly complementing existing transit options. Now, again, optionality is key, right? What works for me in the morning when I'm rushing to work doesn't necessarily work for me in the afternoon when I'm picking up my kids and schlepping their backpacks and macaroni art projects. So it's about having choices. And we're seeing that there's segmentation. That in cities where we have both products, we see it only an 11% overlap. So there's enough room in this industry for everyone. So one, focus on the whole pie. Two, be real about sustainability. We designed our bike to be robust and durable and custom. And let me be honest, there were real trade-offs in that. You know, it took a long time to bring it to market often, and we had supply chain woes. But we made a choice. And when the China bike shirt boom exploded in 2016 with off-the-shelf bikes, I wondered, will this catalyze the industry or will it paralyze the industry? If bikes were considered disposable, were they really sustainable? My concern was that cities might be wondering if micromobility is here to stay and how alternative these transportation options really are. So a new integrated system of transportation is truly a global imperative right now. But we need to realize that ambition. So it's not just about reducing car trips, which is one part of the story, of course, and an important one. It's also about thinking about the life cycle of the system. This means, you know, tracking VMT, minimizing manual redistribution, design iteration for durability on both bikes and scooters, use of clean energy where available, and establishing bona fide recycling programs. And look, this isn't just a tactic to get into the market, right? This is the right thing to do. Our city partners are smart, their citizens are demanding, and they will call bullshit if on, on vendors and operators who promise a big game on sustainability and don't deliver. So whole pie, sustainability, and own up to the challenges. So we talked about the advantages, they're real, they're real. But we also need to be real about the challenges. We haven't figured it out yet. How can we as an industry offer better solutions? Where cities are resistant to dockless mobility, it's often because of a legitimate desire to control public space and concern for the right of way and for safety. And so often we see solutions and regulations that might try to control the means rather than outcomes. For instance, if a city is concerned that there are too many unused vehicles in the public right of way, they 
could consider a demand-based increase rather than a blanket cap, paired with you know, reporting on parking compliance. But remember, these challenges drive innovation. It's this initial challenge that drove us to design an integrated lock onto our bicycle in the first place to allow for responsible parking at a time when the industry was used to dock-based solutions. Now, that's only one way to approach the problem. There are many. There are many, many ways to get the, to the desire, desired outcome. And the point here is, again, to focus on the outcome, which is responsible parking. Let's take San Francisco as an example of how challenges can drive innovation. In San Francisco, the existing system had challenges, right? It was a dock-based system that didn't serve you know, all neighborhoods. It was pedal bikes in a hilly terrain. Um, there was no pay-as-you-go model. It was all subscriptions plus a low-income plan that left a lot of users um, reluctant to basically take on a subscription. And so when we launched, we did so with e-bikes, we added some neighborhoods that hadn't been you know, part of the existing system, and we introduced a pay-as-you-go model so that we could capture the riders that didn't want to pay for a monthly subscription. And the best part about it was we would hear from residents of the Bayview, which was one of the neighborhoods that we connected, that they were taking our bikes every day, and that it was changing their quality of life. Now, we read stat after stat about how you know, riders of micromobility report wellness and happiness, but it's very different to hear it from someone. Um, it, it was, for me, it was like one of the sort of best moments of 2017, when, just after we launched. So in my view, though, of all these challenges, there's one major one that we need to address as an industry, and that's the perception of safety. Now, in my personal view, I'd be much more likely to take a bike or a scooter or form factor Y from my house to the, wherever I'm going if I knew that I had a protected, fully protected bike lane the entire way. And our initial research supports this. So my last simple rule is break into the cycle. We all hear about the chicken and egg problem of safe roads infrastructure. You need policy changes uh, to drive mass adoption. You need mass adoption to drive policy changes. You know, Amsterdam wasn't always a bike nirvana. It was a tangle of cars in the 60s, and it took smart policies, activism, an oil crisis to make change. So we need to focus on what we can do even if it's an incremental step toward awareness. And look, it's not going to be easy. You know, I read this morning that in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, there was a fist fight at a community meeting about bike lanes. So let's be real, this is not going to be easy. Um, but nonetheless, we need to think about what we can do. And one of the things we're doing at Uber um, to this end is a bike alert campaign which we just announced is live in 200 cities, and I experienced on my way here this morning. Um, and this is a push notification to Uber riders, uh, which alerts them that the drop-off is in a bike route. We're also working on the Dutch Reach campaign, which is, focuses on rider awareness and reminding riders to look over their shoulder before they open a car. And on the jump side, we're scoping where we can work with cities on bike lane infrastructure. Again, this is just one step and should be part of a holistic approach. So two years after Jump challenged the North America bike share industry on mode share, and there happens to be that same conference is happening simultaneous with this one, I bring this challenge to you. Break into the cycle. Remember that what we are solving for is not how we enter markets, but how we stay. Thank you.